if the brothers in the audience could see me clearly without distortion, then let me know in the live chat. On my end, it looks like it's distorted. And uh, if that's the case, then I'll cut this feed and just live stream it on Facebook, inshallah. I see there's people watching, anybody in the live uh, anybody that's currently watching, just let me know in the live chat if your screen is blurred or is it clear. Thought you up. <clears throat> With that, now begin Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. والصلاة والسلام على أشراف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد إخوة الإسلام يا عباد الله uh, I welcome every, everyone this evening uh, to this uh, brief reminder insha'Allah uh, hopefully it won't, I won't take too much time uh, but I just wanted to go through an article that I believe would be beneficial, especially considering the fact that there are ideologies that are prevalent today that are mistaken to be from the methodology of the Salaf and in reality is from extremism and uh, narrow-mindedness to say the very least. And this article is from our elder, uh, Sheikh Dawood Adi, uh, and I don't believe I have to explain who he is to the listeners because he's well known to the brothers and sisters here throughout the U.S. Uh, our elder and his efforts in Dawa in, in the U.S. <clears throat> and Yanni is very well known to the to brothers and sisters. Now, this particular article that he wrote, again, it is, mashallah, uh, it gives you, or the reader, yani, the understanding of how Ahl Sunnah deal with Ahl Sunnah when we fall into mistakes. That there is love and compassion and, uh, compassion and the wanting of good for one another, not being dismissive being hasty and having an attitude where we're striving to uh, see our brother uh, fall, for lack of better expressions. So the title here of this particular article is Weighing the Benefits and Harms in Criticism, the story of Afan bin Muslim. And Afan bin Muslim was from amongst the uh, scholars of Hadith during the time of Imam Ahmed Rahimahullah. And so, uh, and like I said, this particular article, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, he has a section on benefits. I'm going to try, I'm going to read through the text. It's about four pages long. Uh, and then there are some benefits, and I'm going to there's about there's 16 benefits, and I only mention a few from those benefits to try and keep this as, as short as possible. I don't want to prolong it or uh, bore the people and thus forth and so on. So without further ado, I'll begin. As Sheikh Dawood Adi, may Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala preserve him. He starts off by saying, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of all that exists. May prayers and peace be upon our Prophet Muhammad, his family, and his companions. It is self-evident to any intelligent person that Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a today is in great need of unification. Now this statement of Sheikh Dawud Adi, uh, this is something that can't be disputed for anybody that has been given two eyes by which they see, two ears by which they hear, and a sound heart uh, uh, and, 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 and which one is able to decipher right and wrong with, 
then you can see that uh, Ahlul Sunnah here in the U.S., we're in great need of unification. So he continues, one of the main sources of division is a callous disregard for weighing the benefits and harms before criticizing each other publicly, resulting in every party rejoicing in what is with themselves while boycotting their brothers, while boycotting their brothers. And we emphasize that, their brothers, right? Allah says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعًا كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ Allah, and I'm going to read uh, the Shaykh's translation, and be not of those who associate others with Allah, of those who split up their religion and become sects, each sect rejoicing in that which is with it. And this is from Surah Al-Rum, verse uh, 32. And the, our elder, he continues, the disregard for weighing benefits and harms is especially destructive when considered within the context in which the Muslims in the West reside. And this is something what, 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 what our elder is stating should be reflected upon he states, Muslims as a whole are a minority. Muslims as a whole are a minority. And those ascribed into the Salafi methodology are a, are a minority among them. Now, uh, when looking at this particular subject matter, or this particular statement of, uh, of Sheikh Dawood Adi, uh, I wanted to do some research just to find out the exact amount or percentage of uh, percentage of Muslims within a society. Now we know the U.S. the population here in the U.S. is over 300, uh, 300 million. From uh, when looking at the Pew Research, the Pew Institute, they, they when they did some research as it relates to the percentage of Muslims that uh, that are in the population, it was barely reaching. 1%. The population of Muslims amongst this 300 million uh, uh, total population of people in the U.S. is barely even reaching 1% of, of that number. And two, in 2017, uh, the, Pew Re the, the, the Pew Institute, the, their research ascertained at that time that Muslims were 3.4 million our population was 3.4 million here, with, here within the U.S. So without a doubt, the Muslims in general, the Muslims in general, we are a minority. We are a minority. And the point that he's making here with the Muslims being a minority, those that attribute themselves to al Minhaj al-Salafi are a minority amongst them. They're a minority amongst them. So this reality should have some type of bearing on our decision making, especially when looking at if whatever it is we're doing is going to bring about benefit or bring about the opposite of that. If it's going to bring about advantages for the Muslims or it's going to bring about the opposite of that. This should have some bearing. We should be keeping these things in mind. And Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala knows best. So our elder, he continues, further division leads to tribal behaviors which are detrimental to the realization of important common interests that need to be implemented to preserve Islam into the next generation. Into the next uh, generation. Now, I'm gonna stop right here for, for a second. I put a footnote here, and I, uh, and I think that the footnote that I put is very important for the Muslims to reflect off of, and that is that the Muslims in general, and Ahl Sunnah specific, we need to yani, really reflect and apply certain principles that are derived from the text of the Quran and the Sunnah especially as it relates to achieving benefits and, re and repelling harm. One such principle that uh, needs to be reflected upon 
is la doror wa la dirar. Now this particular principle, it is derived directly from the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do not harm nor reciprocate with harm. Do not harm nor reciprocate with harm. This particular statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a principle amongst the major uh, principles. Al-Qawa'id al-Fiqiyya al-Kubra. Uh, the, the other principles, just to give some examples, al-Yaqeen la yazulu bishak. Certainty is not removed or done away with by, by way of doubt. Uh, another principle, al-Ada muhakkama. Yani the customs or cultures uh, for lack of better expressions, are, are is an arbitrator, for lack of better uh, translations. Uh, another example of one of the major principles, al-mashaqqa tajlibu at taysir that uh, difficulties bring about ease, and thus forth and so on. So this particular uh, uh, statement of the Prophet sallallahu is included within these five major uh, principles. And this particular principle, uh, it is, when, when, when understood and applied properly, it has yani, a very vast meaning. And I want to take the time, I'm, I'm going to take a second to read some of the statements of Sheikh Saleh uh, Sadilan, Rahimahullah as it relates to this particular principle, right? Because he has one of the most detailed books of Al-Qawa'id Al-Fiqiyya that I've seen from contemporary scholars today. So he states about, and I took the time to translate this, I pre-translated it, so I'll just read directly from the translation. So he states the wording or, and or text of this principle expels and or bans all harm in the absolute sense, consequently making obligatory its prevention, regardless if it's a generalized and or widespread harm or a particularized and or specified harm. In addition, it makes binding the stopping of it, yani that harm, prior to its occurrence by way of various and possible paths of defense and or sheltering. It also includes removal of it after it occurs by way of whatever is possible of steps and or measures that will cease uh, its remnants and or impact and prevent its reoccurrence and prevent its reoccurrence. So this is what this particular principle, Yanni, is pointing to or indicating. From the inception of a, of an, of a harmful occurrence to the occur uh, that thing taking, uh, why it's taking place, and even after it's occurring to, to do away with it, reoccurring once again, this particular principle will cause an individual to analyze all those scenarios to analyze all of those scenarios to ensure that whatever a person says or does, he is reaching the underlying goal, the underlying goal and or intent of the Islamic legislation, to achieving or producing of good and the repelling of harm. And so it's incumbent upon us to reflect off of principles of this nature, to reflect off our statements and actions prior to making them to ensure that we don't produce a mafsada or corruption by way of something we say and or do. Because the Islamic legislation and its goals encourage us with achieving benefit, achieving benefit. And there is no doubt that the splitting of the ranks of the believers 
There is no benefit in that. There is no benefit in that. And so st uh, principles of this nature need to be learned and reflected upon and principles that branch forth from this particular principle in order for, uh, for, the, for us to be better guided in our decisions. And a lot of Barakawatala knows best. So coming back to the statement of uh, our elder Dawud Adi, he continues, unity upon the truth is a desired objective of the Sharia. And the Muslims can actualize numerous benefits through it that help create environments in which they can more easily practice and preserve their deen. Through unity, Muslims may actualize Allah's command. And then he quotes the statement of Allah from Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى And cooperate with one another in righteousness and piety. And cooperate uh, in righteous, with one another in righteousness and piety. So he continues, unity provides a path for Muslims to come together with their resources and efforts in pursuit of urgent and necessary objectives, such as establishing schools, building strong communities that are resilient to non-Muslim influence, establishing services that insulate them against the Haram financial ecosystem, building a unified dawah to invite the non-Muslims and many other matters. And mashallah, when I read this, I, I, I said to myself, mashallah, this is beautiful what, the, what, what our elder uh, is saying here. And this is something that we as uh, Muslims have to be mindful of. Because these things that our elder is referring to if we are practicing Islam the way that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala intends, then these are things that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala will make easy for us to accomplish. And in reality, the lack of us being able to do these things in itself is a proof that shows that, look, somewhere along the way, we're falling short. We're falling short because we're not able to establish this Islamic village uh, in so many words that, that, that our, our elders referring to, because we're split and divided amongst ourselves. We're split and divided amongst ourselves. And I will go further to say, unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of things that, that, that has taken place within the states of boycotts and declaring individuals to be whatever they're declared to be, regardless of if it's uh, this individual is a Pantami or this individual is a Hwani and, and thus forth and so on. All of these things people believe to be from the Sunnah and Salafiyyah, but in reality, it is really from his Biyya and Haddadiyya there's an imbalance taking place. There's an imbalance taking place as it relates to how we deal with our brothers from Ahlul Sunnah. And this is why we're not accomplishing what we could be accomplishing because we're split and divided amongst ourselves. And this, is a re and this, re this reality illustrates that obviously we're not practicing Islam 100% the way that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala intends and the way that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala loves and is pleased with and Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala knows best. But there are several textual evidence within the text of the Quran and the Sunnah uh, that illustrate this, that illustrate this. And I'm gonna quote some that, that are easy for me to quote at the moment. And we have the statement of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala and these ayat uh, should be reflected upon as relates to their meanings. When Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, he says, 
آمنوا واتقوا لفتحنا عليهم بركات من السماء والأرض ولكن كذبوا فأخذناهم بما كانوا يكسبون If the people of the village believed and had a taqwa, then we would have opened up the sky and the earth, pouring forth uh, upon them baraka, pouring forth upon them baraka or blessings. However, they lied. They were, they, they deceived. And so we seized them for that which they used to do. In other words, if they have practiced Islam the way that Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala intend, then Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala would have opened these things up for them. He would have opened these things up for them. Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala he says, wa kana haqqan alayna nasrul mu'minin. And it is a right upon us that we aid the believers that we aid the believers. So Allah wa ta'ala will aid the, the believers like he aided the, the, the generations that came before us in being able to establish his religion. And Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala has made a promise to those that believe from amongst you and those that do righteous good deeds that he will cause you all to inherit the earth like he caused those before you all to inherit the earth. And he will enable you yani, to practice your religion, that which he has chosen for you. And he will exchange for them safety after they had fear, provided that they worship me and do not associate a partner and worship with me. Provided that we are implementing the text of the Quran and the Sunnah the way that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala intends and not implementing the text based off some type of party spirit and thus forth and so on that consequently fractures our ranks and causes us to split here and there and be at odds with one another and pass hookums on one another and thus forth and so on and all these hookums and the splitting and like this all of it is batil all of it is batil and I'm and I am referring to Ahl Sunnah with Ahl Sunnah. The Sunniyun with the Sunniyun. This is, this is what I'm referring to. As this, these types of actions ha has hampered our Dawah and hampered, or, or it, it's hindered, excuse me, our Dawah and hindered our brotherhood, hindered our mutual love and respect for one another, and thus forth and so on. So our elder, he continues, unfortunately, due to the ignorance of the people and their manipulation by claimants to knowledge, manipulation by claimants to knowledge, many have been deceived into believing that subsidiary uh, and extra, po extra po politive, and he has in parentheses, it's Tihadi, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that word correctly. Uh, differences are reasons for separation and boycott. Examples of this would be, for instance, you have a student of knowledge make a judgment call on a matter. But his judgment call is not something that, if he's mistaken, that he's outside of the realms of the sunnah. But he makes a judgment call on, on a matter. And because he makes a judgment call and some people consider that judgment call to be wrong, now here comes the articles on the internet. And uh, uh, the, the calls to boycotting and insinuations of the person being something other than upon the sunnah. And thus for for someone, in reality, it's one of those matters where you could say, yeah, I understood why he did that. I probably wouldn't have made the same move, but I understood why he did that. 
you know, it's one of those types of moves. It's one of, you may not necessarily agree to, with it, but it's not the type of mistake, if, it, if it's considered to be that, where now we're at odds with one another and coming after one another and refuting one another. No, on the contrary, you pick up the phone call and get some advice. Okay, I think it would have been better if you went this route. Or simply ask, Ahi, what was the motivation behind that? Because sometimes you'll find the mo that the motivation of the person, once you find out, once you find that out, you may start to say, well, you know what? Uh, I don't see it as, as big as I thought it was prior to talking to you. But unfortunately, we don't even have people wanting to, wanting to give others phone calls. We're being prejudgmental and judging things from afar. And saying, oh, he did that? Khalas, he must be this. Or silly little statements like, what kind of selfie would do that? And other than that, all from judging these situations from afar, and from a distance, and not having any husnudan, and not calling anyone, and thus forth and so on. None of the things that would be reflective of being merciful to with, with one another, being done, being shown. And this has become a problem. The, our elder, he states, to add insult to injury, this slow isolationism and continuous mitosis has been sold to the people as an evidence of their adherence to the truth since the saved sect has been described with fewness in number by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is a reality that we see occurring. How many people think that being harsh with their brother upon al Hajj Salafi is from Salafiya? How many people, almost as if yani, Salafiya is to uh, be overbearing uh, with, with, with one's opinion and being narrow-minded and being harsh and heavy handed with your brother and thus forth for so on. It's almost as if some people believe Salafia to be this. And this isn't the case. This isn't the case at all. Now, here is a, there's a point that I wanna make that I, that I find myself oft repeating in this day and time. And I think that this point is of great importance because a lot of people uh, don't seem to get it. And that is the point of uh, something that Sheikh uh, Suleiman al-Ruhayli stated when uh, looking at why the scholars differ over individuals. And one thing that has to be understood is that the students of knowledge are trying to apply the same principles and guidelines that the scholars are applying when looking at these uh, situations, right? And so just like the scholars may fall into differing over an individual, then it's not far-fetched that students who are involved in Dawah who are attempting to apply these same principles and guidelines Will fall into sim, uh, fall into differ, differing over an individual similar to that of the scholars. So Sheikh Suleiman al Ruhayli, and I'm repeating, uh, uh, like I said, I've oft repeated this because of its importance. Sheikh Suleiman al Ruhayli stated that uh, there's usually three reasons why the scholars differ over an individual. The first is that they differ as it relates to the uh, to, to, to the speech being attributed to an individual, if he said that or not. And it's usually because some scholars may consider the, the people bringing the information to them to be untrustworthy or unknown or whatever the case may be. They don't accept their statement. Whereas other scholars may accept their statement. Their statement. They may, the people that's, that's talking to them, they may have a good relationship, they know them, or whatever the case may be, but they 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 deem it acceptable to accept uh, speech from these individuals. So this is one of the reasons 
why they may differ over an individual. But then he stated, but then you have a scenario where this speech is firmly established that an individual said that. But now they differ over the meaning of the speech because the speech itself can have more than one possibility. Uh, yeah, I mean, more than one possible meaning, excuse me. It's possible that it could mean this or it's possible that it can mean that. And so some people are understanding it this way and some people are understanding it in another way. And as a result, they differ over what's intended by the speech. And this is why they're differing as it relates to that particular individual. Then, but, but then he stated, if you have a situation where the speech is clear, only one thing can be uh, understood from the speech, then the scholars differ over the weightiness of the speech and how it should be dealt with. Should it be dealt with in this manner or should it be dealt with in another manner? And so some scholars may say, this may not be the best way to produce a maslaha. And other scholars may say, this may not be the best way to produce a maslaha. So these are the same exact things that students of knowledge in the West, the guidelines and the principles that the scholars are looking at, the students in the West are looking at these same guidelines and principles, and most likely are going to differ as it relates to individuals in the same manner. But what needs to be emphasized is that when we find the scholars differing over these individuals, do they become enemies of one another? Do they start to refute one another? Do they now say, oh, I said so-and-so is a mubtadi and Sheikh so-and-so says he's other than that, so now Sheikh so-and-so is a mubtadi too. Do they do that? Do we, is that the example that we find in them? Anybody with any intellect that knows and has, uh, and has been around the scholars for even a small amount of time knows that that is not occurring. So then why do we do this here in the West? Whose minhaj is that? Whose minhaj is that? And how has that, that approach benefited us and benefited our communities? These are rhetorical questions because we know the reality. They haven't benefited us. They haven't benefited our communities. This is haphazardness. This is foolishness. That's causing our, uh, that, that's, that's, that's a direct, uh, that's a direct, uh, uh, that, that's a direct uh, cause to, this, to, the, to, to, to the hindering of our growth these types of foolish actions. And so at some point we have to say enough is enough. Enough is enough. <clears throat> Our elder, he continues, the story of Afan bin Muslim and how his contemporaries dealt with him during a trying time demonstrates the importance of exercising wisdom, thoughtfulness, and compassion in dealing with the faults of the Muslims. And we know that compassion is having sympathy, pity, uh, sympathy, pity, and concern uh, for those who are suffering from a misfortune. Having yeah, I need some concern, some, some sympathy, and thus forth and so on. This is what we as Muslims should be having for our brothers. But that which we, we've been witness, witnessing from amongst a, a his, among us, we haven't been seeing compassion. Is it from compassion to blast a brother for going to the movies and put that all over the internet? That's compassion? That should have been something that was uh, a hidden. What was the compassion in that? What was the mercy in that? And then, so on one page, you always hear these types of individuals say, Allah Sunnah, the most merciful of mankind. Is that from mercy? Is that from compassion? Is that from wanting good for your brother? 
And then they say this individual, well, he had a whole lot of mistakes. Well, at that time, from everybody that's talked to me that was in, that knew about that situation and was involved in it, they said this brother was striving to rectify uh, the, the mistakes and the problems that brothers had with him. He was going to people trying to rectify his situation. So did the warnings actually benefit our brother or harm our brother? Did it benefit or harm our brother? And can it honestly be said that the way that he was dealt with was in accordance with the prophetic methodology of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We can, can we honestly say that? Can we honestly attribute that to Allah's religion? Honestly? So we have to stop the haphazardness. Our elder, he continues. Give me a second, I lost my place. Didn't know what the fuck. Our elder continues, characteristics which should be an integral part of our Islamic cultivation. Wisdom, thoughtfulness, compassion. These should be an integral part of our Islamic cultivation. I th how long have I been talking? Have I been talking for over an hour? I'm not sure. Or just about an hour? <clears throat> the excerpt, the ec the, this, excuse me, this excerpt from Af Afan's life also shows us that the Salaf would carefully weigh the benefits and harms in their criticism, recognizing that not every fault of, of their brother is considered worthy of boycott or humiliation. And this is something that should, that, it, that this point right here that's being made is very important. Not every mistake merits boycott and humiliation. This is especially the case when such criticism is directed towards an individual with a history of notable efforts in the service of Islam upon the correct methodology. This was the restraint of the Salaf in the face of valid criticism regarding grave errors by their brothers. How much more so than if the criticism itself is invalid, is invalid. And this is a point that I've been trying to make. When I did that video, your Salafi really. And when I did the video, uh, video the, the Sheikh, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, the Sheikh Al-Albani suffered from Tamyi. The point that I was making in both of those videos, was basically that someone from Ahlul Sunnah that is perceived to have made a mistake and how we deal with them. Not someone that has actually made a mistake, but is perceived to have made a mistake. Because unfortunately, we deal with brothers who have been who, who are perceived to made to, to, to have made a mistake in a very haphazard manner without picking up the phone calling to ascertain what is the reality of the action or statement the statement that they said or the action that they've done we're not we're not investigating anything which is running off in a haphazard manner running off in a haphazard manner especially when dealing with people that have efforts that are considered to be praiseworthy within the within Allah the Baraka wa Ta'ala's religion. That was the point of those talks for those that saw those talks. And so our elder, he continues, may Allah give us all success in what he loves and is pleased with and may prayers and peace be upon our Prophet Muhammad uh, so now he goes into the part I'm just going to read through it uh, because I feel like I've been talking for too long now 
uh, the story of Afan bin Muslim. And he states, our elder states, Afan bin Muslim, Abu Uthman, as Safar al Basri, born 134 years after the Hijra, so that's around 751 Christian era, died 219 years after the Hijra, and that's around 834 Christian era. This individual was an Imam, a Hafid, and a Muhaddith of Al Iraq. From among the students who narrated from him were Imam were Imams al-Bukhari, Ali bin al-Madini, and Yahya ibn Ma'in. Yani, also notably who, uh, th from those that narrated from him was Ahmed ibn Hanbal or Imam Ahmed. So he continues, al-Fasawi or al-Basawi said in his book, I, I'm real bad when reading uh, transliterations. I, it would have been nice if it would have actually been in Arabic. But it looks like it's saying Al Ma'rifa wa Tariq that Salama bin Shabib said, I said to Ahmed ibn Hanbal, I requested the whereabouts of Afan ibn Muslim at his house. So they, the inhabitants, replied that he had left. So I exited going out asking for him. And it was said, he went in that direction. So I continued my journey asking for his whereabouts until I ended up at a graveyard. And lo and behold, I found him sitting at the grave of the daughter of my brother, Dhuria Satane reciting, he found them at the grave reciting. So I spat at him, then said, what a repugnant thing you are doing. Afan replied, oh son and so, oh so and so, bread, bread. I retorted with a supplication against him. May Allah not satisfy your stomach. So he was at the grave reciting the Quran for money. So, and this may Allah not satisfy your stomach. A, may you not gain any food to fulfill your needs. Salama said, so Ahmed ibn Hanbal said to me, do not mention this event that you have witnessed regarding Afan to anyone. For indeed, he took a stance during the times of the fitna when people were saying that the Quran was created. That makes him one to be commended and worthy of praise due to his courageous stance during those times or something similar to this from his statements. Now look at how Imam Ahmed dealt with him. Look at how Imam Ahmed dealt with him. This is an example of compassion. This is an example of concern for him and thus forth and so on. Our elder, he, he also writes, Hanbal uh, bin Ishaq said, I was in the presence of Abu Abdullah Ahmed bin Muhammad ibn Hanbal and Yahya bin Ma'in while they were with Afan during the time when Ishaq bin Ibrahim summoned him to participate in the trial of the Quran being created. In parentheses, he puts, it should be known that Afan, in the parentheses, Afan was from among the first of those to, to be put to trial. The morning after he was tested, Yahya questioned him. Abu Abdullah was there, uh, Abu Abdullah was there and we were also present. So he said, inform us what Ishaq said to you. He said, oh, Abu Zakaria, yani, uh, Yahya bin Ma'in, I do not desire to render your face nor the faces of your companions with expressions of sorrow, grief, or displeasure. But the reality is that I did not reply to their questioning. So he replied to him saying, therefore, what actually happened? Now he's questioning him on what took place that day. 
Afan then said, they summoned me and read the letter to me written by Al-Ma'mun. Al-Ma'mun. Uh, I wish I could see that in, in, in Arabic. In al uh, in Al Jazeera, and what it contained was the instruction to put Afan to trial with the affair of the Quran being created, and proud him to say, "The Quran is such and such." Afan said that the letter said, "If he says and affirms that, then I will leave uh, will leave him to himself. A, I will no longer push him to say that the Quran is created." and he will be free to leave and continue his profession. And continue his profession. If he does not comply with, that, with what I have written and sent to him by way of you, then discontinue what he has been receiving. Uh, and that was support, the, the support of 500, 500 dirham uh, per month. So when he read the letter to me, Ishaq then said, so what are you going to say in response to the ruler? Thus Afan said, I recited to him, Kul huwallahu ahad, say he, Allah, is unique in his oneness to the end until I completed the chapter of Al-Ikhlas. Thereafter, Afan said, I said, is this speech I have just recited to you created. He said, O Sheikh, the commander of the believers is say, the commander of the believer of the believers is saying that if you do not comply with what he is beckoning you to beckoning you to, he will cut off what is being contributed, yani his salary. Upon that, I replied with the statement of Allah in Surah al dhariyat and in the heaven is your provision and whatever you are promised. Thus he became silent, then I departed. Now this is showing, what, what this is showing us is that because he took a stance and he stayed in accordance with the truth, he suffered from that financially because that monthly stipend that was given to him by the leadership was now cut off. It was now cut off. And that was the very reason that he was at the graveyard reciting the Quran for money because he had no other means of livelihood. So this brings context to the condition and or situation of Afan and why he was doing what, what, he, what it was that he was doing. And so to continue and, and to close out, thus he became solid, then I departed. As a result, Abu Abdullah, Yani Ahmed bin Hanbal and Yahya bin Ma'in were pleased to hear how Afan dealt with his ordeal regarding the letter, the letter from the Khalifa at that time. <clears throat> <clears throat> so these imams, they understood why his condition was the way that it was. And they understood uh, what caused him to, to do what he was doing. Doesn't necessarily mean that they were pleased with what, he, with what he was doing, but they understood why he was doing what he was doing. And these imams show compassion for Afan. They show compassion for him and for his condition and our situation. This is in contrast to what we see occurring today of people who claim to be upon their way. How many from amongst the people that are suffering from his bi and hadadiyya are claiming to be upon the way of uh, Imam Ahmed and Yahya ibn Ma'in and others from amongst the Ayyama to Salaf? But do we see their concern and or compassion for their brothers that fall into faults? For their brothers that have accomplished uh, things that are considered to be uh, extraordinary within the, uh, within the religion and the work that they've put in and the efforts and thus forth for so on, do we see them acting compassionately with them? 
Do we see them have a concern for them and their situations and thus forth and so on? Or do we see this haphazard approach that is a direct cause to the splitting amongst us? These are rhetorical questions. We already know the answers. We already know the answers. But it's time for us to reverse course. It's time for us to reverse course. Now, Sheikh Dawood Adib, after that, mentions benefits from, from the story of Afan. So I'm going to just mention some of them that are very relevant to what we're discussing tonight. So, uh, the, one of the benefits he mentions, if mentioning the faults of a person is going to result in a harm that is greater than the benefit, it should be avoided. I'm going to repeat that. If mentioning the faults of a person is going to result in a harm that is greater than the benefit, it should be avoided. It should be avoided. Another benefit, Imam Ahmed exercised patience and wisdom in weighing the benefits and the harms before criticizing Afan. He did not make Afan's mistake later in life a cause for disregarding his firm stance during the trials regarding the, the, the Quran being created. Another benefit, the Salaf strove to find excuses for the Muslim and to not assume the worst about them. Do not assume the worst about them. We definitely need, definitely need more of that today. Another benefit, Afan was known for calling the people to Tawheed and the pure Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf and for opposing religious innovations during a tumultuous time, all of which deserve praise, commendation, and exaltation. Another benefit, if a Muslim is known to be upon goodness but then falls into an error, the error is rejected while his honor is maintained. Another benefit, Afan's situation demonstrates the harms and ill effects of the scholar, student of knowledge, <clears throat> or caller not being self-sufficient and financially independent when faced with agents of oppression and suppression. Allah Mustan. Allahu Akbar. Another benefit. The Muslim should be patient and cover the fault of, the, of his brother unless there is a greater public interest or benefit in exposing it, like to protect the people from a real or imminent, not merely perceived or imaginary harm emanating from that person. And as a heavy emphasis, I'm gonna repeat that, heavy emphasis, because the, the brother gives an example of what he means, heavy emphasis on not merely perceived or imaginary, but there has to be a real, imminent, overt, and manifest harm that could emanate from the person. <clears throat> the Muslim should strive to be fair and unbiased, judging his brothers within the holistic context of, of their situations. And this is very important. This is very important. And not, re, and not reducing their reality to their low moments, compromised circumstances, sound bites, and exceptions to their known conditions. This is a very important benefit, very important. The Muslim should deal with the people of Sunnah with gentleness. The Muslim should deal with the person of Sunnah with gentleness. And, and there are other benefits that our elder Dawood Adib derived from that. But I'm looking at the counter now. And it, uh, I've been speaking for 56 minutes, and that's enough time, to be quite honest. Uh, I just wanted to go through that just to, because this is, a, this is an excellent example Masha'Allah, of how Ahl Sunnah deals with Ahl Sunnah. And it's hope that we start reflecting off, off of articles like this and actually applying it 
when dealing with our brothers in order to do away with the ills that we see occurring today and to actually achieve the benefits that are that are that we are encouraged with within the text of the Quran and the Sunnah from love and mutual cooperation. And Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala knows best. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.